Uh, real quick, uh, you're all juniors, okay, and you're all taking the test on March 1st here. Wonderful. Um, who has never taken the ACT before? Oh, all of you have except, except you. What's your name? Malachi. Sorry? Malachi. 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 Cool. Um, have you seen an ACT before? Ah, uh, it's different. Here, I'll give you one. Uh, now you've seen an ACT. Okay, I'll give it to everybody in a minute. All right, uh, who has taken it only one time? Okay, who's, well, that's good. I mean, it sounds like a lot of you have taken more than that. Who has uh, taken it just twice? Very good. Who's taken it three times? Three times. Who's taken it four? Excellent. Who's taken it five? That's it? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay. Very good. How, how, how often can you take the ACD? How many times can you take it? As many as you want. As, well, it used to be. It used to be until about ten years ago, and then they limited it to, anybody know? Twelve. Twelve times is the maximum number of times you can take it, right? Um, and by the way, you have every incentive to do that. You have every incentive to take it as often as you possibly can. Twelve might sound like a lot, but it's not really. They give the test seven times a year, three in the, uh, the national test dates. They give it three in the fall. September, October, December, three in the spring, February, April, June, and one in the summer, uh, July. So that's seven tests a year. And it may sound like a lot, uh, but I often say, what, what else are you going to do on a Saturday morning, right? Except take the ACT or sleep in, right? So you may as well get up early, take the ACT, prepare for it each time. The more times you take it well prepared, the better you do, right? Um, so, and the colleges will take every, uh, the best score you send. They don't care how many times you take it. Couldn't care less. All they want to know is, what's your best score? Okay? So you have every incentive to take the test as often as you possibly can. But of course, you want to prepare for each one also. You wouldn't go, you know, take up a sport and just compete every month or so or every week or so without practicing and training and getting some good coaching, right? Same thing for, uh, on the ACT. The, the difference is, on the ACT, everything happens much faster. You can improve much, much, much more quickly than you can in a sport. In a sport, you think maybe in terms of next year, um, as far as getting to the next level is concerned. So you start, uh, maybe you're a, J, a, D, a good JV player in 10th grade, and you think, OK, if I work hard over the, fo uh, next, the following year, I'll, I'll be ready for the varsity uh, squad uh, in my junior year, right? So you think about it in terms of a year to get to the next level in a sport. On the ACT, literally a week, maybe a few days. Gee, what are we doing? We're we meeting today, tomorrow, and Thursday. Hmm. Yeah, and then you take the test at the end of that week. You'll be ready to score higher, um, a lot higher potentially. Somebody in this class is going to score six points higher, maybe eight on the next test. Who's it going to be? Impossible to say. We'll find out. But somebody will. Somebody will score a lot. Hopefully, you'll all score, you know, two or three or more points higher. Some of you only get maybe a point. That's okay. Um, but then you do it over and over and over and over again. Take the, t take the HD as often as you possibly can and prepare each time. There's no point in taking the test without preparing each time for it. Just like a sport, you get better and better and better at it. The ACT is very much a strategy-based test. What do I mean by that? It's not a content test. They're not testing you on a lot of math or a lot of science. Okay? They're not testing you on your encyclopedic knowledge of the rules of grammar and punctuation. Mm -mm. Um, they're testing on basic, basic uh, information that you need, okay? like arithmetic and elementary geometry, which is on this sheet that I just gave you. Okay? And your ability to read, very important in life. Okay? Um, is there any content tested in reading? Like on, on, the reading, on the reading section of the ACT, they give you some passages, they, answer, they ask you some questions, right? Do you need to know anything to answer those questions? No, the answers are all in the passages. Okay? Um, on the English, when, you, uh, when they ask you to recognize correctly written sentences, that's basically what the English is, right? Are these sentences correctly written? Um, are you aware of using, when you speak and write, are you, are you thinking like, if, you, if you're writing your first sentence in a paper for uh, an English class or a history class, is, is the first thought you, you have, gee, I need a subject. <laughs> uh, do I need a verb? What's, what's, the, what's the verb I need? Now I need an adjective or an adverb. And what about a, maybe I want to use a gerund here or a participle. Do we think like that? No, we have an idea when we express it, just like I'm doing now. You know, you talk to your best friend, 
you want to see how their day went, you say, hey, how was your day? Is everything going okay? Blah, 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 blah. And you speak naturally and fluently in complete sentences without even thinking about it. So the English is really no content either, right? As long as you can speak and write in full sentences, which obviously you all can, there's no reason why you shouldn't get a perfect score on the English or close to it. So how come, why are we not scoring perfectly on the English automatically? Just too many careless mistakes, okay? So we're going to talk about how to get rid of those today. The next section is math, right? So um, what's on the math? Believe it or not, it's just arithmetic and elementary geometry, okay? Um, I know it's hard to believe, but I'll, I'll prove it as we, we, we go along. Um, the stuff that looks like Algebra 1, Algebra 2, pre-cal, that's just smoke and mirrors to fool you, okay? Um, and a large part of what I teach is recognizing how, t how simple the test really is, okay, and then approaching in that way. Okay. And that frees you up to do the most important thing on the ACT. Those of you who've taken the test before, what is the biggest challenge in the test? Time. Time. Time pressure. Um, it's, it's the most time pressured test you guys will take in your life, in all, in all likelihood. I've, I've never seen a test. I teach a lot of different tests, um, especially in the past. Um, and I've seen, a, I've seen uh, tests that are harder. I've seen tests that are longer. But I've never seen a test that was as time pressured as the ACT. And that is the secret to the test. Okay, so the secret, the secret to the ACT, I'm giving it to, I'm giving it to you quickly because we don't have much time, um, is two parts, is twofold. It's an elementary school test in disguise, up to seventh grade, believe it or not, and mostly up to fourth grade. Actually, if you work it out, it's 90% of the content that is tested on the ACT is learned by fourth grade. Isn't that crazy? All of the English, all of the reading, all of the science, you know enough to get a perfect score by fourth grade. The science section, does it test any knowledge of science? Not at all. Not a single fact of science. Isn't that crazy? It's called a science section, but it, it tests no science. All it does is test your ability to find answers quickly in? Graphs. In charts and graphs, exactly, exactly. So there's no content to speak of on the English, none on the reading, none on the science. That leaves the math, and the math is mostly up to fourth grade. 80% of the math you need, you learn by fourth grade. So overall, a fourth grader knows all the English, all the reading and all the science they need, and they know 80% of the math. If you, if you average that out, 100%, 100%, 100%, and 80%, that's 90%. The fourth grader knows 90% of what's on the test. That means a fourth grader can score 35 on the ACT. Mm -hmm. I'm not kidding. I'm not, I've, I've never met that fourth grader. I mean, I may, I may have, because I have taught fourth graders. It's a long story. But um, I, I once taught a first grader and a kindergartner, two brothers, for the ACT. Can you believe that? Now, it wasn't serious. They weren't going to take the test, but it was just a, I was offering a, a boot camp kind of like this, and a parent wanted to bring their kids over, and, I said, and they said, well, he's pretty, they're pretty young. I said, well, how young? First grade and kindergarten. Eh, send them along, send them along. Can a first grader read? Sure. Can they do arithmetic? Well, they can add and subtract, right? Um, can, they find, uh, can, they read, can they read a question and find uh, data in a chart? Oh, sure. Yeah. Can they speak in correct full sentences? First grade? Yeah. You could probably do that by, by the time you're fifth, five or six years old. Interesting, isn't it? Um, so a, four, a, a, fourth, a fourth grader could literally get a 35 on the ACT. 36 on the English, 36 on the reading, 36 on the science, and knows enough to get a 30 on the math. And that's a 34.5 average and rounds off to a 35. So I'm totally serious. Now, we do give the, we do, we do give the ACT every year to seventh graders for the Duke Talent Search Program. Has anybody taken it in seventh grade? Oh, cool, 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 cool. Well, that's excellent. Wow, wow. Um, quick rule of thumb. Whatever you got in seventh grade, you can add 10 to 12 points. And that's what you should get as a junior or senior or by the time you're done. Hmm, pretty good, huh? That's not just me talking. That's been my experience in, in doing this for about 40 years now. I've noticed my students that start in seventh grade end up doing about 10 points or more better by the time they're... But that's not just me talking. The... Um, uh, Duke Talent Search Program themselves actually say that. They say you can expect your score to increase 10 to 12 points by the time you're a junior or senior. Now, why is that? Is that because you learn so much more in high school that's relevant to the ACT? Mm -mm, very good, you're following. No, because it's not a content test. So what's the difference between the same seventh grader and the same senior five years later? What's different about them that would... Preparation. P 
Possibly. Possibly. Yeah, they've, they've got more. Like they've got, strategies. Okay, but they've got to learn the strategy somewhere. When you, so how old are you when you're in ninth grade, typically? 14. Four, let's say 14. And then how old are you as a senior? 17 or 18? What happens between 14 and 18? We physically grow and get stronger. But also we mentally grow and get stronger intellectually. Yeah, the difference is that your brain is just stronger when you're a junior and senior. And therefore you'll be able to do all the simple stuff that's on the ACT better. You'll be a better reader. You'll be a better calculator. Okay? Uh, you'll be able to reason more accurately and more quickly. Yeah, the brain develops. That's the difference. So it's not the content that matters. So you can start as early as you like. Um, but you'll get, you'll get better and better and better naturally. But of course, as you're practicing and approaching the test the correct way, obviously you'll get much, much, much better. Um, why, why, um, there are seventh graders every year who get a 36 on the ACT. I had one about, gosh, about 12 years ago now. In fifth grade, she scored a 27 on her own. Sixth grade, she took my class and got a 33 uh, in sixth grade. And then in seventh grade, she got a perfect 36. She wanted to skip two years and go to Central High School in Little Rock, and they wouldn't let her. So she, she said, ah, what the heck. She just skipped uh, high school and went straight to college. She went to ULR on the Donaghy Scholarship, you know, the top scholarship they've got. And um, everything was paid for, and she got $8,000 a year pocket money. It's gone up, apparently. Uh, but anyway, she got $8,000 pocket money, and she, she graduated with $32,000 in her pocket. And then she went on to get a PhD in art history of all things. And everybody thought she was a genius. I think everybody thought she was a genius. I don't think she was a genius. She was very, very, very bright. Years later, I, I'd been thinking about it, and it suddenly occurred to me what it was about her. It was that she loved to think. That's what it was. She was always thinking, and she loved to do it. So she was a happy, very happy person, always smiling. And you could see her, like, you could, you could like, see her thinking. So if you, if you like to think and you do it a lot, you get good at it, just like anything that you happen to like, right? Okay, so I'm telling you all this to, tell you, to, to show you that you already, need to know, you already know everything that you need to know to get a perfect score. You just have to apply it correctly. So, this, so everything we talk about will be strategy and technique. So the strategy is recognize how simple a test really is, approach it that way, and then go as fast as you possibly can because it's such a time-pressured test. You literally have to work twice as fast on the ACT as you're trained to do in school. It's a very different test. It's so different from what you do in school. That's why it's so tricky. That's why students are scoring so far below their potential. You know, some of you might be, I'm sure a lot of you are straight A students, or some of you anyway, and um, you may have taken the ACD once or twice, and like, how come my score is so low relative to my GPA? That's, that's, the, that's the most common complaint that I get. Well, it's because the ACT is such a different test. It's not harder, it's just different. Uh, in fact, if you're a really good student, you might be uh, at a disadvantage because you've been trained to do it the school way so well that when you take the ACT, you take it the same way, but that's not the way to do it. So in school, what are you told to do on a test? Read the directions, take your time, and check your work. There's no time to do any of that on the ACT. We've got to go right into it. We have to work as fast as we possibly can. We're not going to have any time to check our work. And so we have to, go, we have to work as quickly as we can and as carefully as we can. Okay? All right. Any questions so far? All right. What time is it? I've got 15, questions, uh, 15 minutes, 15, 15 or 20. Oh, I have a little leeway. I think I'll use it. OK. Um, if, if you let me, I'll talk all day. OK. So um, any questions on this sheet? No, no questions about what we talked about? OK. So um, all right, so let's do, uh, let's do a couple things real quick. If I took a rectangle and asked you how many degrees are contained in it, what would you say? 360. 360. And why? Four 90 degree corners. Excellent. So that's a very good common sense reason as to why there are 360 degrees in rectangle. I like it. Give me another reason, another common sense reason. Not quite as obvious, but still fairly obvious. Who said that? I knew it. Okay. Yes. Two triangles. Very good. You can, you can divide the rectangle into two triangles, and we know that a triangle has... 180 degrees, 180 times 2 is 360. Very, very good. Um, very useful, co useful concept uh, on the ACT because we can use that idea to figure out how many degrees there are in any polygon. Okay? So, for example, uh, let's say you had a pentagon and they asked you how many degrees are contained in it. They'd, they'd ask you this on the ACT. 
um, you could divide it into triangles. One, two, three times how many degrees? 180 is 540. Some people think that, you know, if you ask them, how many degrees are there in a polygon, they go 360. No, 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 no. Not every polygon has 360 degrees. In fact, the triangle only has 180, right? And the rectangle, or, or any four-sided figure, by the way, it doesn't matter, it, it could be drawn, you know, like that. And you can divide it into two triangles, right? So any quadrilateral, any four-sided figure has two triangles in it. Pentagon has three, hexagon has four, right? Times 180 is 720. So every time you, every, every time you add a side, you add another triangle, which adds another 180 degrees. Kind of cool, huh? All right. Um, what's the formula? Does anybody remember the formula for this in school? You learned it probably in 10th grade, 9th or 10th or 11th. Probably, probably, probably 9th. Is that what you're going to say? Yeah. N minus 2, which is the number of sides, times 180. Take the pentagon. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 sides minus 2 is 3, which is the number of triangles times 180. So the formula actually says find the number of triangles in the polygon. What's easier to remember, the formula or the triangles? The formula? I was hoping you'd say triangles. <laughs> but don't you like the idea, though, dividing into triangles? Okay. Um, another reason why it's very useful to know that um, you can divide a rectangle into two triangles is for the area formula uh, for both. What is the um, area of a rectangle? Base times height. Very good. Length times width. Base. I, I kind of like base times height better than length times width because it clues me into the area of a triangle, which is what? One half base times height, because the triangle is one half the rectangle. Get it? Very simple. Who who'd thought of it that way before, that the triangle is half a rectangle? Not too, some of us. Good, good, good. I was in college one day, and it suddenly occurred to me. I was, walking, I was walking across the quad, and I went, oh, my God. A triangle is half a rectangle. Never thought of it before. Isn't that crazy? I know. I'm kind of embarrassed to admit it. I was captain of my math team in high school. Big deal. But um, and I didn't even know that. No one ever, no one ever told me. Uh, I never read it anywhere. I never thought about it. Oh, my God. Why was this such a big deal? Because I'd always uh, remembered the area of a rectangle, no problem. In fact, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's intuitive almost that you know, the area of a rectangle, you would take the base, right, and then fill it up with the height to get the area. Would that make sense? It seems intuitive. But the, area, but the area of a triangle, one half base times height, is not intuitive at all unless you think of it as half the rectangle. All right. Uh, and by the way, it doesn't matter how you draw the triangle. As long as you start in one corner, go to the top, and come back down to the other corner, okay? as long as you inscribe it in the rectangle, the area is always half of the rectangle because the base is always the same and the height is always the same. Isn't that cool? I mean, I always thought that was neat. As long as you inscribe it, the base is always the same and the height's always the same. Hmm. Kind of neat. All right. Um, look at one through seven. Okay? All of those you learn by fourth grade. You may not remember, but you learn this, all of this by fourth grade. And then you saw it again, all of it, every year, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. And then you went to high school. And now they never talk about it anymore, or rarely, some of it, right? Um, and that's why we get rusty on this stuff. Okay? Now, there are a few things that, uh, well, if you take number, uh, if you take the Pythagorean theorem, um, Factoring and foiling number 11. Um, who learned to factor and foil? Do you, do you guys remember when you learned to factor and foil? What grade was it? Factoring. Factoring. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, you, uh, like number, number, number 11. Factoring and foiling. Did you do it in seventh grade, eighth grade? Eighth grade. Oh, yeah, eighth grade. Okay. All right. I usually say seventh, but I was a year ahead. That's okay. So eighth grade. Um, how, about, how about the Pythagorean theorem? Oh, really? Excellent. I never heard sixth. What? Did, uh, what? <laughs> did you guys, guys learn it in seventh grade? No, like ninth, grade. ninth grade? Oh, you definitely, you definitely covered it again in ninth grade. Did anybody see it in seventh, the Pythagorean theorem? Eighth? How about ninth? Ninth. Who doesn't really remember? Okay, yeah, it's, it's up to her. Okay. Um, 
But even the most, even, even the most advanced stuff here you learn well before uh, junior or senior year, right? Um, are there any questions on any of this? Because I don't want to spend all our time on this sheet. Okay. Um, how about sine, cosine, tangent? Who's not learned what sine, cosine, tangent is or are? Everyone's learned it? I've learned it. But, but you don't remember too well. That's okay. So we'll go over it very quickly. All right. So um, you take a triangle, right? You pick an angle other than the right angle. Uh, let's say this one. Call it X, right? And then you label the sides of the triangle according to that angle. So the side that's across from it, or what do we say in trig? Oh, nope. Opposite. opposite, right. So think of, it, think of it as the opposite side of the street, opposite side of the room, right? Opposite side. Opposite the angle. The side next to it, or adjacent to it, you call it adjacent side. And then the hypotenuse is always the longest side across from the right angle, with the, the diagonal. Don't think of it as a diagonal, because it's that can be tricky. Sometimes the ACD likes to do this to you, very often, actually. They'll, they'll put the triangle and rest it on the hypotenuse. And if you think of the hypotenuse as a diagonal, you might think that's the diagonal, but it's not, right? That, that, that's the hypotenuse. It's actually this. Everybody got it? Okay, be careful. Think of, the, think of the hypotenuse as a cross from the right angle on the longest side. Okay, so what is sine? It's a ratio. By the way, when do you learn ratios? What grade? Fourth grade. Well, third grade is actually when you learn ratios, right? Fractions. And the ratio is what? the opposite to the hypotenuse. Whatever those numbers happen to be, suppose it was a three, four, five, three, four, five right triangle, then the sine of the angle x would be the opposite three over the hypotenuse five. It just, it, it'll be a ratio of, of the sides, okay? And then the cosine would be what? The adjacent hypotenuse, and then tangent would be? Very good, the opposite to the adjacent, right? Got to know this. You got to know everything on this page. The most important items, make a note of it, are 1 to 8 and 10 and 11. Those are the most important. Those are the ones that come up a lot on the ACT. The others, not so much. That's 10 items, okay? There's one thing that's not on that sheet that should be that is slope, and we'll talk about slope, okay? Remember slope, uh, rise over, run, what goes on top, the y's or the x's? The y's, the difference of the y's over the difference of the x's. What is the equation of a line, you guys remember? Y equals mx plus b. As long as you know that, you know what you need to know about slope. Okay, um, so how do we remember sine, cosine, tangent? Excellent, does everyone know that one? Some old hippie caught another hippie tripping on it. So we learned it, we remember it by so, ka, Toa, right? Sine is opposite of hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. And tangent is opposite over adjacent. And a nice little trick to remember it is some old hippie caught another hippie tripping on acid. That's the most popular one. There are, there are others, some of which we probably can't say, but that's okay. Um, by the way, I was in college again, and uh, I was doing some trig, and I hadn't done it for a couple of years, and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna need Sokotoa. So I wrote down Sokotoa like this, so ka toa right? And I went, so, 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 so what? It took me like five minutes to figure it out. I left out the H's. So ever since then, I give it the guttural uh, pronunciation, so toa okay? That way I don't forget. Seriously, I always think of it that way. All right, good. Um, make sure you know that really, really well. And, sorry? Oh, that's right. So, um, and of course, uh, area of a circle, pi r squared. squared. That's funny, I thought pi's are round. Get it? Such a, such a dumb, dumb little joke. Um, remember, so, um, area is pi r squared, and circumference is 2 pi r, the other one. You gotta know these, you gotta know these like, like that. So, if you get confused, remember that area is always in square units. Square feet, square yards, square miles. So pi r squared. And then circumference would just be, it wouldn't be squared, it would just be a linear dimension. So 2 pi r, okay? 
All right, that's it for this sheet. Let me pass out the test. And let's see, take one and pass them down. That we're going to use. You got one. All right. One for you. I'll get you a couple more, I think. This test was given um, fairly recently, in the past year, I think. So possibly one of two of you might have seen it, actually. Anybody uh, need one? Oh, yeah, you guys, definitely. There's one here. Oh, did it? Perfect. What a gentleman. He passed his on to his friends. That was nice. That was nice. OK. Um, what's our time? Oh, sorry. And you need one more? One more. And you probably want one. And would you like one? Yes. Yes. All right. Was that too far over? No. OK. Good. We're going to. You never get as much done as you think you're going to get done. You just you don't. All right, here we go. English, uh, 45 minutes to do 75 questions. Okay? English is the one section that's easy to finish. Okay? We, want, we don't want to dilly-dally, but um, you should find it uh, uh, no problem to finish. The math, reading, and science are virtually impossible to finish. Not impossible, but very, very, very difficult. Um, but you can learn to do it with great training and practice. And some practice. Okay? Um, and that's our goal is to get faster and faster and faster while getting more and more accurate. Interesting, isn't it? All right. Um, there are five passages on the English, 15 questions each. And, what they, and that, that gives you nine minutes per passage. Make a note of that, because obviously timing is really important. So uh, we'll just say, put up here, nine minutes per passage on the English. Just make a note of that at the top of the page. OK. What, what, do they, what do they ask you to do? They give you uh, passages. They underline portions of the passage and ask you, are they correctly written? OK. And you answer A, no change, if it's, if it's correct. Uh, and then you pick one of the other chances, uh, choice if it's wrong. OK. The key to the English is to read carefully and trust your ear. We said earlier that you guys all know how to speak properly in full sentences and correct sentences. Um, virtually automatically. So let's take advantage of that, all right? So we read carefully and trust our ear. Um, sliding stones to the Forbidden City. The Forbidden City, built in the 15th and 16th centuries in Beijing, China, is a complex consisting of the Imperial Palace and 980 surrounding buildings. How's that sound? Sounds fine, doesn't it? Doesn't sound terrible, that's for sure. Good. The answer is no change. Um, Look at B. The Forbidden City, built in the 15th and 16th centuries in Beijing, China, which is a complex. Is, is that correct? No. Um, the Forbidden City, built in the 15th and 16th centuries in Beijing, China, dash, a complex consisting. Does that work? No. It's missing the verb, right? There is no verb. Same thing with D. It's missing the verb. Um, so C and D take out the word is, so you lose the verb. And then uh, B adds uh, the word which in, which makes it, um, uh, instead, of, uh, instead of a full sentence, makes it a dependent clause. You don't have to know that, but you just listen carefully and trust your ear. All right. Number two, a large number of massive stones were used in its construction. Some of them featured elaborate carvings. This is tricky. Did it sound good? Yeah, it sounded good. It didn't sound good to you? I'll do it again. A large number of massive stones were used in its construction. Some of them featured elaborate carvings. Sounded good to me. In fact, if I, if I just, uh, if, if, if you weren't reading it, if you just heard it, you'd say it was a good sentence, a good construction, because it could be. Your ear is not perfect, by the way. It's very, very good. Um, but it can't hear all punctuation. Can you tell the difference between a comma and a dash just with your ear? No. Or a period and a semicolon? What is a semicolon, by the way? What does it do? Separates the two places. Do demand. Exactly. Uh, a semicolon acts just like a period. So you can't tell the difference. OK? So you just have to know the rules. OK. Um, so this is a very important rule on the ACT. 
the, the most important punctuation rule, and you have to know it, okay? Because your ear can't do it by itself. Um, I've got two independent clauses here. A large number of massive stones were used in its construction. That's a full sentence. Some of them featured elaborate carvings. That's a full sentence, isn't it? Okay. If you're going to connect them with a comma, you also need a? We'll get to that. But if you wanted to do what they did here with a comma, you also need to do, does anybody remember a comma and a con, 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 conju, conjunct, conjunct, <laughs> you, you're so close, conjunction. Yeah, you need a conjunction. I knew we'd get there, conjunction. We need a conjunction. All right, so there are six ways um, to connect independent clauses. Um, let me see if I can get this clean. I know we're getting close to time. How, how, how? Five more minutes? A few more minutes. <laughs> when, when I say five and you say a few, I know it's less than five. Okay, here we go. Um, so make a note of this. He punched me in the nose, period. I began to bleed. Two full sentences, right? Okay. I can use a comma and a conjunction to connect them. He punched me in the nose, comma, so I began to bleed. Okay? I can use a semicolon because it acts just like a period, okay? I can use the semicolon with a conjunctive adverb, very good, like therefore, comma, I began to bleed, okay? And I can use a dash. Who, who knew you could use a dash to connect independent clauses? Who knew that? You knew that, excellent. See, see, see how few people knew it? Almost nobody knew it. And you can use a, anybody know? There's one other way. Almost nobody would know this. A colon. Can you believe that? You can use a colon to connect independent clauses. Okay? So, these are the six different ways to connect independent clauses. You gotta know them. And um, they, they, they solve this question a little bit differently. You mentioned dependent clause. We'll talk about that tomorrow. All right, before you guys go, I'm gonna say one other thing about the English and then I'm gonna give you a little homework, okay? So, um, the other big rule on the English section, besides uh, reading carefully and trusting your ear, is that shorter answers tend to be correct. Because good English is brief and to the point. Bad English is wordy, and the ACT takes that very, very seriously. So don't automatically pick the shortest one, but always be on the lookout for wordy answer choices, okay? All right, so I was I told I was allowed to give you homework, now, I'm, not a, I'm a coach, not a teacher, so if you don't get to the homework, there's no penalty. You're not gonna be, <laughs> you're not gonna be graded on this. But I'm gonna go ahead and say, who thinks they're gonna have some, uh, some time to do a little bit of homework on this tonight? Nobody. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I want you guys to try to do the first two passages for tomorrow of the English. Passage one and two, okay? Uh, it's nine minutes each, that's 18 minutes of work. It's no big deal, okay? Hopefully. All right, I'll see you tomorrow. And hopefully we'll, have, we'll uh, get those, those two patches done. I think I should time myself for don't, worry, don't worry about timing yourself. Don't worry about timing yourself.